Welcome back. You may not know this, but congenital heart defects are the number one killer of babies. Luckily for us here in South Florida, we have one of the preeminent experts in the field. Here is Dr. Michael Black. Dr. Black, thank you so much for being on the show and joining us. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you for having me. All right, let's start with this. Congenital heart defects in babies are actually the number one killer of babies as they affect approximately one in 100 kids. I mean, that's a pretty high number. It's very high. One in 100 kids are born with heart disease. Now, yeah. that's not to say they all need surgery, but they will need some type of attention, whether medical therapy, surgery, or nothing but they have a problem. And a lot of those defects uh, apparently often go undetected, right, until adulthood. They can be missed. Uh, the most critical ones are usually picked up either when a woman is pregnant or soon after the baby is born. But sometimes you have an adult who goes to 60 or 70 years of, of age and has a problem they didn't notice. Wow. Uh, well, let's start with, just by way of definition, uh, what exactly is a congenital heart defect? Um, great question. Uh, congenital heart disease is basically a malformation or a improper formation of the heart during pregnancy. So when a woman finds out she's pregnant, the heart's already formed. And by then it's beating and it's probably abnormal in its configuration and then that develops through the pregnancy. Why are they so often missed? Is it that the current system of, I guess, studying babies' hearts is not as uh, effective as it needs to be? Um, depends on the severity of the defects. So uh, what currently has happened in the last, I would say, five to ten years is that the diagnosis of heart disease is being picked up much, much earlier. So the obstetrician and gynecologist may do an ultrasound, notice something's a little off, maybe send it to a perinatologist or a cardiologist with expertise in fetal ultrasound technology and they'll pick it up. But a lot of times the heart defect's not that severe. If it's a hole in the heart, um, it, you can go for many years uh, and usually it's when a doctor either uh, goes on holiday or the kid goes for a camp uh, examination if they're seven or eight and somebody hears a little murmur, a noise, um, or the patient complains, the kid complains of uh, either a chest pain or shortness of breath that will bring them to a doctor's attention. I would imagine uh, for a parent hearing that your child has some sort of heart defect has to be probably very scary, right? It's very scary because you imagine uh, that you're going to have your chest uh, you know, cut open and with this large incision and obviously it has risks, every operation has risks, uh, but thank goodness most of them end up being uh, very positive and the outcomes are excellent. Uh, so you can live a full and fruitful life with most conditions. At the Palm Beach Children's Hospital, you guys are doing some, some new stuff, some really cool cutting edge stuff. Tell me about the process that you have there. Sure. So I uh, emigrated from California recently. I was in California. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I was in the heart of Silicon Valley. I was uh, chief at Stanford University for many years. And um, I'm very into technology. So I had uh, fetal labs. I uh, it was instrumental in robotics. In fact, I think I was the first person in the world to do a heart operation on a kid with a robot. Uh, the robot has my patents in it. So I'm, I'm very um, uh, technological able. And I've made a whole profession over 20 years of making very, very tiny incisions. So I don't usually make very large incisions, whether you're an adult or a child. Uh, my length of stay is very short. It's usually two days uh, after a heart operation for a kid. Adults are a little wimpier, and I hate to say <laughs> it, especially if you're a man. If you're a woman with kids, you're the toughest. You're like a young kid. You want to get out of hospital, go to the kids. Uh, take me back to what you said a few minutes ago, uh, the robot, the robotic surgery. Explain that more. That sounds fascinating. Yeah, the robot's a great th uh, invention, and it will only get better. So uh, when it first started, the, the conception was you would make these small little ports in the body, little holes, and you would put these end effectors, a little arm with a little wrist and a little hand on it, and you'd be able to have this six degrees of freedom, just like a normal human hand. So when they first invented a robot, they were like chopsticks. You couldn't really move them, so you were kind of doing these gross movements. It was very ineffective. Mm -hmm. But as the technology got better, you stick these little arms in, and the robotic arms are, you could tie a knot, you could do everything. And the camera, they have one camera for each eyeball, so it's very depth perception stereoscopic. The defect is you have no haptics. You can't feel anything. Right. So for a surgeon to put a needle through uh, material, you want to really feel things. So you have to imagine a little bit, and they're working on better haptics. So in the beginning, they tried to do that, but you can imagine there's a size limitation. So in an adult, you can drop one lung, and then you have a lot of space. In the belly, you can expand the belly. So the robot actually took off for prostate surgery, bariatric surgery, a lot of OB-GYN technologies, because you insufflate the belly with carbon dioxide, you have a lot more room. The chest is confined, it's a box. Okay. So it's a little harder, and in kids it's even harder. But the robot technology will only get better, and I'm working with um, 
certain companies on uh, motion um, compensation. So using software from a GPU, NVIDIA makes GPU uh, controls for most computers, you can actually make the heart stand still, literally. Even though it's beating, the computer nullifies all the motion and then you're operating on a, a still heart. So I think in the next 10 years, there'll be even more improvements. This is amazing stuff. Yes. You know, somebody like me, a layman who only understood sort of half of what he said, is that's still incredible stuff. Yeah. yeah. And, I, you know, it's amazing because you think that people are trying to fly to Mars. What happens if they get appendicitis? I mean, who's going to operate on them? Are you going to take a, a general surgeon, a cardiac surgeon? And, you know, who's going to go right. with them? So there's a lot of thoughts that um, we should be able to operate at distances. The trouble is lag time. So unfortunately, the day before 9-11, um, it didn't get much publicity, obviously, but there was a gallbladder that was taken out in Strasbourg, France, but the surgeon was sitting in New York City. Wow. And it was done all over, uh, you know, uh, the internet. And even if there was a lag of a microsecond, it was a gallbladder. It's not moving, but a heart moves. So Amazing stuff. That is mind-boggling. Uh, the pulse oximeter, what is that all about? Yeah, that's a fantastic thing for the state of Florida. So around the country, and I came from California where this was already mandated, Florida's just set up a regulation so every hospital that has a neonatal unit will perform this oximetry test. So what happens is when a fetus is uh, ready to de deliver into a neonate, a newborn baby, there's three things in the heart that close. So if the fetus has really crazy heart plumbing and then these things close, the baby could die. So what happens is in the hospital, they'll put an oximetry probe. It measures the amount of oxygen in your blood, and they put it on an upper arm and a leg. And if both of them are the same, then you're fine. If there's a difference between the two, you can pick up a very subtle heart defect so you prevent the baby from going home, and then maybe three, four, or five days later, certain things close, and the baby either is going to be very, very sick or die. So by doing this test in all newborn nurseries, hopefully will prevent uh, these unexpected deaths and, and prevent these disasters. Yes. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. This was great. But the w last thing I want to ask you is, what should parents look out for uh, if they have a newborn child? Um, you know, for a first baby, it's very difficult. So when a parent has a first child, you're nervous about everything. The baby's crying, you don't know if it's a diaper, you don't know if they're hungry. But if you're worried that they're breathing too fast or they're sweating or they're not putting on weight, they're not eating, don't wait too long. The pediatricians are very good. And if something's not right, ask your parents. So if the grandparents are around, they've seen kids before. And if they're just a little uneasy, then uh, really make an appointment with a pediatrician and get in to see somebody as soon as possible. Better safe than sorry. Honestly. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, if people want to ask you questions, get a hold of you, how do they do that? Uh, they can call my office directly. Or, uh, the number is 561-227-9240. Dr. Black, it was great having you here. Fascinating stuff Dave, that you're working so on. thanks so much. And we'll have to have you come back, all right? I hope so. Yeah, Thank you. Absolutely. Take Real care. Real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Black. When we come back, if you've recently been fired, don't despair. We've got a local entrepreneur and author on how you can turn things around. Stick around.